Hello, Guilty Feminist. This is Deborah. There's nothing I enjoy more than recording live episodes of The Guilty Feminist. It's so wonderful to be back out on stage meeting you all and sharing our hypocrisies and insecurities once again, as well as our noble goals. We've been doing this show for seven years now, over 350 episodes, and there's a lot in our back catalogue that you've never heard or forgotten. So once in a while, we're going to use this regular Monday slot to give you a little look back in time. I've asked various Guilty Feminist regulars to cast their minds back over the shows they've been in and the shows they've enjoyed listening to and pick some favourite moments to relive. We're starting with Sarah Pascoe, who has put together an amazing collection of stand-up performances from our shows. And she's here to introduce the moments that she loved the most. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Debs. Now, I'm a feminist, but I prefer my feminism funny. It's such a relief to have a nice smile after all of the exhausting anger and disappointment. Now, I'm not saying that all feminists need to have jokes. Don't at me, Simone de Beauvoir. Just, I love it when they do. So here are some standout, stand-up moments from the Guilty Feminist archives. And we're starting with Jen Brister back in August 2017. We're always saying how feminism isn't about being anti-men, but Jen proves how it can be very enjoyable to make fun of them a little bit. I think we can all agree, men have the greatest privilege of all in lots of ways, don't they? Because they're allowed to age. You know, have you noticed that? Men are allowed to get craggy and old and hairy and fat. And what do the straight women in the room do? You look at your partner, don't you? You go, ooh. <laughs> Isn't he rugged? <laughs> He's so sexy. <laughs> look at that porn. She hasn't seen his dick since 1983. <laughs> ooh. Meanwhile, as women, what are we doing? We're always having to feel like we have to look younger, don't we? We're sort of laminating our faces and ironing our necks and Botoxing everything. Botox, that's the thing I don't understand. Why are we bothering with that? It's always the thing that actors do, don't they? They Botox their faces. Why would you paralyse the one part of your body you need in order to do your job properly? about you are happy and sad and angry tell your face love because no one knows <laughs> can you imagine boxers botoxing their arms it'd be shit <laughs> what i think is when we should try to look uh, younger anymore I don't, I don't i don't think we should buy into that i think we should just look good for our age you know what i mean i don't want to look younger than my years of 42 i'm going to say it out loud I've said it there now you know i just want to look Good for 42, yeah? Now, I don't know, maybe it's because, maybe because it is a, I'm a big old lezard, but I see you ladies. <laughs> oh, I see you, yeah? And I see women that are certainly my age and older, and, I, and I, sometimes I notice women, that, you know, like in their 50s, 60s and 70s, you know, women that really look after themselves, they look elegant and beautiful, they don't look younger than their age, they just look really good for their age, and you just look at them and you think, my God, you are gorgeous. My God, you are beautiful. I hope that when I get to your age, I look as good as you. Yeah? And then you look at their husbands, don't you? And you find yourself thinking... Oh! <laughs> what the hell's happening there, fella? Look at your wife, she's absolutely stunning! The least you could have done is shaved your fucking ears! <laughs> I have a lot of straight girlfriends who say things like this to me. They go, Jen, you wouldn't understand this, but as a woman... <laughs> you wouldn't understand this, but as a woman, it's really hard because when you hit middle age, you become invisible to men. And how can I have any sense of self worth if when I walk into a room, a man doesn't notice me? How can I augment my self esteem if a man I find physically repulsive? <laughs> doesn't notice me when I want to know. I can't have any sense of agency, Jen. If a man that uh, makes my fucking skin crawl <laughs> doesn't want to fuck me. <laughs> and obviously, I, I, I really feel for, for my friends. I really do. I don't actually have that problem because 
I actually suffer from a condition, a lot of gay women suffer from this condition, and it actually gets worse as you get older, but I'm, um, I'm man blind. <laughs> so I can't see you people. I can hear you. <laughs> so I know how to avoid you. <laughs> but if you can't see me, well, then that's win fucking win as far as I can go. Luckily for us, we can see Jen Brister. Find her on the socials and you'll find clips and gig listings there as well. Next up, I'm a feminist, but I still want to look sexy sometimes. Lucky for me, here's Felicity Ward with some advice. Hello. Um, sexuality has always been something that I found quite challenging. When I was younger, I was quite a tomboy, and then I sort of went through a very weird stage. That hasn't changed a lot. Um, and then uh, when I was about 27, I broke up with a partner that I'd been with for eight years, he'd been my only sexual partner and then everything kind of changed and I came over to the UK and I was like in one of those like, oh, I'm gonna do little things I've never done before and I was listening to a lot of Beyonce and trying red lipstick for the first time, <laughs> feeling terrified and paranoid at the same time. You know, when you first wear red lipstick, you're like, oh yeah, I can do this and you walk out, you're like, you look like a slut. You look like a slut. <laughs> so um, I came to the UK <laughs> And then you're like, but being a slut isn't a bad thing. That's all right, we include everyone. And just back and forth and back and forth, just like a ping pong ball. And so I came over here and, uh, and I tried online dating for the first time. And uh, give us a cheer if you've tried online dating. <laughs> yes, yeah, good. Lots of you are good. It sounds like you've had positive experiences. Because uh, if you don't, they usually go... <laughs> I did not have a great time. I did it for six months and the whole time I was on there, I went on one date. He turned up half an hour late and lied about his age by 10 years. <gasps> yeah, he said he was 21, he was 11. <laughs> I'm like, we're gonna find out if you lie on your profiles, guys, especially if your mum drops you off. It is a dead <laughs> giveaway. But the other thing I tried was I'd never been to a beautician before. When I left this guy, I went, I went I'm going to go to a beautician for the first time. And so I went to this lady and she was lovely, but she was uh, waxing my legs. And in the middle of it, she just looked up, just nonchalantly. And she said, just while I'm waxing your legs, would you like me to do your toes as well? <laughs> I said, sorry, what? And she said, just while I'm doing your legs, would you like me to do your toes as well? And I said, no, thank you, no. And would you like to know why? Because I'm not a gibbon and I'm not a hobbit, yeah? So let's just stick the arrangement. A half leg in my asshole is fine. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> just looking at the confused men in the audience. Going, do you think she's got a hairy asshole? <laughs> a lot of hair on her head doesn't have a tash, I don't understand. Things change a lot, especially with sexuality. Like when I was younger, I was interested in men who were spirited and adventurous. And then as I got older, I just settled for a guy that didn't have nickel back in his collection, you know? <laughs> and when I was younger, there was those sex lines that you would call up, they were late night sex lines and they'd call up and they'd go, oh, what are you wearing? She's like, oh, something that I earn with my minimum wage. And like that doesn't do it for me anymore. Once you're over 30, I don't think that works. And so I wish that there was an over 30s hotline that you could call up that was just dedicated for over 30s. And I call up and I go, hello. And then someone answer, I go, hello? I go, who's this? It's Keith. I go, I would like to speak to someone else, please. Because <laughs> I'm in my 30s, I have choice. <laughs> so then someone else would get on the phone and I'd say, hello, and he'd say, hello, and I'd say, who's this? And he'd say, it's Rowan. Oh, Rowan. What are you, what are you, uh, what are you doing, Rowan? I'm listening to you, but I'm turning off the television first. What are you, what are you doing to me, though, Rowan? I'm expressing my needs and setting clear boundaries with you. <laughs> What? Like, what kind of boundaries would you set with me, Rowan? Well, I won't be able to spend all my time with you because I have a niece and she's very important in my life. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. Are you? Yeah, I'm a feminist. Holy shit. <laughs> 
tell me what I want to hear, Rowan. You want to hear it? Yeah, I want to hear it. You want to hear it? Yeah, I want to hear it. All right, I'm financially manageable. Yes! <laughs> what else? I want to sit you down and talk about values and a possible family. I'm close. I'm very, very close. Give me the big one, Rowan. You want the big one? Yeah, I want the big one. You want the big one? Yeah, I want the big one. All right, I'm emotionally available. Bang! <laughs> That is a phone call I would fucking pay for. Good night! Felicity is comedically available if you want to go and see her live, and you definitely should. Find her on Instagram and TikTok. I'm a feminist, but I enjoy irony as much as the next man. Irony, such as dealing with the topic of seeing and being seen, on a podcast where the listener can't see anything. Here's Sophie Duker rocking it on the subject. Try and visualise her as much as you can. Hello, Jedi Feminists! Oh, God, I'm speaking through the same microphone, but can everybody hear me? Yes! Lovely, can everybody see me? Yes! Can everybody feel me? <laughs> Ooh, OK, the correct answer is not without my express consent. All right! to be here to do some chatting on the theme of uh, see and be seen. Um, I just want to say uh, very quickly, last time I was on The Guilty Feminist, I was not out. I mean, I was, but I was uh, not out to my mum. So I'm very excited to be on The Guilty Feminist and say that I am a queer woman. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, My pronouns are she, her and that bitch. Hey. exciting to be here. Um, I wanted to, um, since it's the thing of seeing and being seen and uh, being reflected is very exciting for me as an entertainer, I want to tell you uh, some facts about myself so you get a little bit of a sense of my character. So the first fact that I want to tell you lovely people today is that I am an eldest child. Ooh, some woos. Do we have any eldest children in the audience? Okay, I love eldest children because you guys are leaders, but you're reluctant leaders. You've got leaderness <laughs> thrust upon you. Have we got any younger children in the audience? Yeah. Ooh, always louder, you smug pricks. <laughs> uh, middle children, I would ask you to cheer, but as we all know, you're not important. <laughs> Uh, The second fact that I want to tell you about myself, some of the more spiritual of you will already have picked up on. I am an Aquarius born in the year of the horse. Mm, An Aquarius born in the year of the horse. What could that mean? Nothing. It's bullshit. (laughs) The last fact, possibly the most exciting fact, is that I am a very notable not a white guy. Have you got any white guys in? <laughs> Come on, guys, cheer louder. We know how much you get paid. White guys! <laughs> white guys, is there a minute? White guy, do you identify as a white guy? Yes, oh, wonderful. I don't mean to pick on the white guy in the audience because I, like, I've, I've got anything against you. I genuinely love white men. Love your work. Bob Dylan. Mwah. Uh, <laughs> It's very exciting. I don't have anything at all against white men, apart from, obviously, everything it is that they've done. <laughs> Some of my best friends. <laughs> some of my best, some of my best friends are white. <laughs> my mother is a white man. Um, but the reason, the reason I speak to you, and I, I promise I'm not, I'm not going to be mean to you at all. The reason I speak to you is because I want to know what is it like uh, being a white man at the moment for you. Difficult. Difficult. <laughs> I would say so. Um, no, it is. It's, I think it's a weird time uh, for white men because they were always the ones that got to see and be seen. Like, but now, like, they're feeling increasingly under threat. Like, you know, like the rhino and the shark, great white men going extinct. <laughs> <laughs> difficult to deal with because like the world is changing and as like a queer woman of colour like white men are saying like oh Sophie we like want to be you we want to be like you which I find strange because I am very short um, <laughs> and I think it's amazing like the way the world has changed the way that different people are being seen and I think this year someone at the BBC said that if you're going to put together a team like now in 2018 if you're going to put together a team it's not going to be six Oxbridge white blokes it's not going to be six Oxbridge white blokes it's going to be a diverse range of people that represent the modern world isn't that amazing a diverse range of people that represent the modern world and quite right too because in the past 
there were no black people. <laughs> I don't know what he means by that. I don't know why people still think that diversity is like a modern thing. I don't know if this guy thinks that black people are a thing that literally just happened, like fidget spinners. <laughs> Or that black people are a thing that keep coming in and out like flares. <laughs> I think that he thinks that black people were a thing that happened like ages ago, but then they just like went away for a long time and they've only just come back. So like tens of dozens of hundreds of thousands of years ago, the last black man strolled across the prehistoric plain and then slipped and fell in a hole and got frozen in ice and then got defrosted on the 1st of August 1937 in his name was Morgan Freeman. <laughs> it's very important for me to see and be seen because when I was little, I was so jealous of all the amazing role models that little white girls have. I mean, like, little white girls have so many amazing... Amazing? Um, <laughs> they shave often. Uh, little white girls have so many amazing role models like Hillary Clinton, Emma Watson, Peppa Pig. But I... <laughs> didn't have that and because of that I ended up over identifying with anyone who was brown who wasn't on crime watch like and even now even now I end up over identifying with people because of the colour of their skin so I see people like the Olympian Nicola Adams and I see her and I think oh great I too can be a boxer <laughs> you know or I see someone like the comedian Lenny Henry and I think oh great I too could be Ainsley Harriet <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. I've been so happy to you. You've been lovely. Sophie wants to be seen, and she deserves to be seen. Have a Google and find her tour dates. You'll have an absolute blast. I'm a feminist, but I still sometimes get drunk and shout how there's enough women in comedy. No more new ones. There's no room. Luckily, no one ever listens, and there are more and more amazing acts all the time. And here's one of them, the brilliant Celia A.B. Hello, everyone. Woo! It's lovely being here. My name is Celia. I'm from Paris. It's good, isn't it? <laughs> now, I did live in Birmingham for seven years willingly. Let's talk about that. <laughs> Um, I lived in Birmingham for seven years on purpose. So, um, the reason is because on day one, I saw the funniest thing I've seen in my entire life at New Street Station. It was a really drunk man. He was scooched over singing, She's electric. <laughs> to a vending machine. <laughs> That's when I knew. It's like, this is the town for me. I, did, I, moved, I moved to London now, though, because I was tired of feeling attractive. So, it's... <laughs> It's good to be humbled. Um, I'm, not, I'm not just French, I'll explain the face. I'm uh, half Algerian, which is a small Muslim country just outside Slough, right on the, <laughs> right on the outskirts. I tick a lot of boxes, I do. I tick a lot of boxes. But my favorite box to tick at the minute is um, I've been wearing pregnancy dresses. <laughs> and I'm not pregnant. <laughs> I think that in life, you don't dress for the job that you have. <laughs> you dress for the job that you want. And the job I want is maternity leave. It is... <laughs> mm. yes, Love maternity leave. So currently in the UK, don't tell anyone I've told you this, there's not a single law against faking pregnancies. <laughs> Uh, seriously, when you're sitting at work on Monday, like a mug, <laughs> think of what you could be doing instead. Do you know what I mean? Go and start the rest of your life. <laughs> Furlough forever. <laughs> the reason I fake pregnancy is because I used to work in an office and I'd had enough, so... It's like, do you know what? I'm tired of working in an office. I think working in an office, it's all about escapism. It's about pretending that right now, you're not there. And I used to work in a proper, like, British office, where it was just people wearing beige, <laughs> talking about lunch. You know the vibe? <laughs> You'll recognize this woman. What are you going to have for your lunch? <laughs> I'm going to have a jacket. <laughs> With no butter, <laughs> no soap, just a raw potato. <laughs> What are you going to have? <laughs> the 
think it's about escapism, though. Like, I think we're very smart. The way we escape when we're in an office is we put a picture on our background of a beach. <laughs> As if to say, I'm not in the office. <laughs> I'm in the Bahamas. Now, I've been to the Bahamas a couple of years ago. I'm very lucky. And you'll never believe it because their backgrounds, various offices in Coventry. <laughs> But you have to work, you have to work. You have to get a job, you have to work. But I think it's interesting to have a day job and a passion. Has anybody here got a day job and a passion? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what it is? It's frustrating because people will ask you, when are you going to quit your job? And it's not up to you. It's about, to, it's about loads of different people in the industry. And it's also about the way you see it. Do you know what I mean? So like the way I see it now, my job, it's comedy. And I just have a passion for admin. <laughs> And if anything, my admin career, I'm fucking crushing it. <laughs> Never done a single hour of admin unpaid. I was a natural. <laughs> you have to work there. Like, I wish I was a multimillionaire. Do you know who I feel bad for? Jeff Bezos. I'll be honest, hard to get people on board with that, though. <laughs> I'll tell you why I feel bad for him, because he's a multi-billionaire. And we all hate him. <laughs> and do you know how I know we hate him? Because he went to space and no one cared. <laughs> he, was, he was probably in space, like going, they're gonna love this. <laughs> Jeffrey, come to the pub with us, they'll say. <laughs> Jeffrey, you're so attractive, let me blow you. <laughs> They'll say that. <laughs> Jeffrey, Jeffrey, <laughs> Jeffrey. And then he came back. He was like, but you got a couple of questions. And we went, no, we don't. <laughs> and that's how I know we hate him. Because there's a girl at my work. I don't like her. But if she goes to Milton Keynes at the weekend, I'll ask about it. <laughs> I've acclimated to England. I've been here seven years. I was in Birmingham, so it's like dog years. So it's like, you know, it feels... <laughs> feels longer. <laughs> but I'm just like you, do you know what I mean? I am. I've acclimated. I've ended my will with no worries if not. <laughs> Very polite. <laughs> I do like it here in England. I just got settled status after 10 months of waiting. 10 months, 10 months of waiting. And 10 months is a long time to think on whether or not I like meal deals that much. You know I mean? it's, like, it's a long time. By the way, love that it's called settled status. You're not thriving in England. <laughs> You're settling. Come down with us. <laughs> Come down. I hope you like salt. <laughs> and I'm fascinated with England as a nation because there's usually a nice mix of like, Low self-esteem, but high ego. Mmm, <laughs> delicious. And I think it's because you used to have an empire, but now all you've got left is pebble beaches. <laughs> and I think in life, there's nothing more humbling than walking on a pebble beach. Because <laughs> you're going to be the hottest person on earth, or the toughest gangster on earth, but on a pebble beach, you look so silly. <laughs> look like a little boy. <laughs> trying to get to his mum for a sandwich. <laughs> so a couple of lads, quite rough, they were about to fight. He went, Oi, come here, I'm going to fuck you up. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh, this one's nice. <laughs> Skip that one. I'm addicted to my phone. Anyone else? Yeah. Fucking love my phone. I wish I was on my phone right now. <laughs> so much. My phone knows me more than anyone else in my entire life. It does. But my phone's a bit sneaky. Like the other day I was trying to make a payment and it filled up all of my bank details. Except the security code. <laughs> and I love that my phone like pretends. <laughs> like it doesn't know it. Do you know what I mean? Like I've, I've put that security code a hundred thousand times and when it gets to it my phone just goes No, you do it. <laughs> I 
I have been here a long time, and I've, I've, do you know what, I've looked around. I've looked around, I can do a very good impression of a British person, do you want to hear it? Yeah, I need more enthusiasm than that. Are you ready? I'll start over there because this is theatre. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I'm sorry, can I just squeeze past? <laughs> there was a British person being born. <laughs> Set the AP, everybody! Well, this is a British person saying, Excuse me, can I just say that Celia is fantastic and you should go and see her live as soon as you can? I'm a feminist, but I still find time to chill out, kick back, and try and remember how to laugh. Here's Jessica Foster Q being sublime, just as live gigs were permitted again in May 2022. Seamless, very natural, seamless. Um, hello, York. <laughs> it's nice to be back doing this again, isn't it? <laughs> Yes, bit bloody lovely. Um, so nice to all be squidged in all together en masse again. <laughs> I think it is. I don't know if this is controversial, but I don't think that human beings were designed to be a bit scared for two years. <laughs> um, everybody's had a bonkers last three years. I've had an extraordinary amount of change in the last three years. So about that time ago, I managed to leave a nine-year relationship. Um, that's a happy thing. It had gone to crumbs, dust, not even the ghost of a friendship left in there. Uh, <laughs> but it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to leave a nine-year relationship. Because after nine years, everything's tangled up, isn't it? Finances were tangled up with him. I'd had a kid with him. Living situation was tangled up with him. Leaving him also involved, leaving my sexuality as I then knew it. Social life tangled up with him. Work stuff tangled up with him. Still, I managed to leave that relationship. Why can't I leave a WhatsApp group? <laughs> I can't. Eventually, it's going to have to get to the stage where I'm in the mall. <laughs> Nine years is a long time, though, um, to be out of the dating game. And, oh, it had changed. Crumbs alive, it had changed in nine years. I hadn't expected it to go 100% online. I knew it might go like a load more online, because that's obviously the way the world is going, but not 100%, because young people in here won't know this, but in the olden days, <laughs> if you met your partner on the internet, you were a freak. <laughs> And now, it's the law. You've got to have a whole CV, haven't you? You've got a whole exhibition of photographs of yourself looking sexy during hobbies. <laughs> you, you're not allowed, if you dare, now, if you dare approach a stranger in real life. Young people, IRL. <laughs> Say, you know, at them something like, please, may I fancy you? <laughs> they're, they're allowed to ring the police. Online dating's a minefield as well, though. It's so complicated. There's so many issues with it. Dick pics, for a start. Everyone's getting pics of dicks they don't want. Oh, God, as if there could be a more glaring example of how feminism's work is yet to be finished, for crying out loud. <laughs> Some comedian friends of mine are telling me they get upwards of ten dicks. They didn't last four per week. That's so many dicks. That's so many pics of dicks. Unbelievable to me that there are still men in the universe that think she'd probably like a look at... No, what is... I can't believe that. But more troubling, perhaps, than all of that um, is why have I never got one, though? And it's not an invitation. It's not an invitation. But it does, when it's apparently so prolific, <laughs> it does make you think, oh, what vibes am I, am I giving out? <laughs> This is not like I don't get any contact from strangers. I do, but it's sort of... Like, the other week, I got an email. I mean, that says it all, doesn't it? I got an email. Um, I got an email. I got an email, right, from a man called Tony. Um, and it said, it said, Dear Jess... Dear Jess, I really like some of your work. So, I'm writing a short film, and I'd like you to do a part of it to make it funnier. Um, I've got a budget of £40. I need to talk to you about this today or tomorrow. Tony. Um, and I found that so insulting. I'll be honest, I'd rather see a picture of his horrible little witch. That's awful. 
And I wish I could channel the confidence of younger women when it comes to online dating. I think I struggle with the fact that you're meant to be so sure of what you are and want, <laughs> aren't you? And the confidence, I've got, I'm very lucky, I've got two uh, Gen Z sisters. I wish I could be as fierce as them. One of my sisters started university recently. Before, before she went, I took her for lunch, right? And nothing makes you feel old, like when you catch yourself saying to a 19-year-old, so are you seeing anyone? <laughs> He's <laughs> taking one at the moment. Um, and how cool is this? 19. She went, oh, God, no. <laughs> she went, I find boys my age pathetic. <laughs> she went, I'm just going to have like a hot girl summer. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? I've Googled it, and I'm not sure anyone knows. <laughs> um, but, but from what I can see, it looks exhausting. Um, and I'm not sure if it's appropriate for me. I think perhaps I'm just going to aim for, like, a warm woman's spring. <laughs> but with the old dating, I decided to try and be honest. I think you've got to try and be honest. But, you know, I say that. I tried to be honest, but also I did... I did also want to get picked. <laughs> you don't get fancy, don't you? Get swiped up or whatever it is. You, I wanted to get chosen. I, I did want that, but how to? You know, how do you be honest about like having a young child and being a stand-up comedian whilst also making yourself sound like a catch? <laughs> <laughs> I'm available for sexy dates between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> my lexicon is so sanitised by parenthood that the other night I said goodbye to a taxi driver by going, Nan night, sleep well. <laughs> <laughs> and the biggest slap round the face I got that dating was going to be different this time round, nine years on with my life where it is now, was this, right? So historically, whenever I've been single, I've really enjoyed putting it about. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking loads of people. Um, no shame in that, it's 2022. Borderline pride, arguably, I'd say. No one was harmed in the making of that fun. Yum, yum, in my vagina. Um, but it's meant that once or twice in my life I've had to do the awkward but responsible thing of phoning someone up and saying, well, one of us has given the other one some kind of STI. <laughs> it's embarrassing, isn't it? But it's only only grown-up thing to do. Well, this time round, I genuinely had to phone someone and say, I'm so, I'm so sorry, but um, I'm pretty confident I've given you nits. <laughs> she's a human antidepressant and she's working up her new show for Edinburgh and beyond go find her on the internet and catch her IRL now that I know what that stands for Hey, Guilty Feminists, this is Deborah. We've got some shows coming up at Soho Theatre on the 30th of May and the 31st of May. Co-hosts and guests include Chloe Petz, Laura Lex, Sarah Keyworth and sketch group Egg. We're also at King's Place on the 5th of June, the 22nd of June and the 24th of July. Co-hosts and guests to be announced. For tickets, go to guiltyfeminist.com and click on Live Shows. My play Never Have I Ever is at Chichester Festival Theatre on the 1st of September and tickets are on sale now, going fast. Go to cft.org.uk and look for Never Have I Ever. And on the 21st of August, there'll be a special episode of the Guilty Feminist podcast there, live from Chichester. Also, you can join our Patreon to get ad-free episodes and to support the show. Please go to Apple Podcasts and review us. You can review any episode that you liked. If you've reviewed us before, you can review us again, but please give us five stars. It helps other people find the podcast. Or you could tell someone you know who might enjoy the show on a WhatsApp or with your face. And now, back to the podcast. I'm a feminist, but I let myself down in other ways. For instance, I'm not very good at geography. I always thought London was in London, but apparently she's mostly in LA these days. And here she is smashing it at the Royal Albert Hall back in 2019. It's London Hughes. Queen! Absolute queen. Big up Debs, proper queen. Hello, Royal Albert Hall! Hey! I feel famous. This is crazy. Um, I'm London Hughes. I'm very funny. Um, I'm hilarious. For those that don't know me, I'm a really amazing black female comic. I look a bit like Beyonce, if you're listening on the podcast, I look a lot like Beyonce. Um, it's crazy being a black female comic in Britain, though, man, because when I walk out on stage, most people think I'm a singer. Do you know what I mean? 
I've got to prove to them I'm actually funny. And I'm hilarious, right? Oh, I'll make you laugh out loud. It's going gonna, it's gonna to happen now. I just turned 30, guys. I turned 30 a month ago. I know I don't look it. I know I look about 22, but I just turned 30. I know, it's not a joke. I just turned 30. It's hard for me, though, because I'm 30, I'm sexy, I'm successful, I'm rich as fuck. I'm fucking rich, bruv. Like, when I go McDonald's, I go McDonald's in Chelsea, yeah? <laughs> fucking rich, bruv, do you know what I mean? I'm rich, I ain't got no gag reflex. <laughs> None, they call me the seagull. <laughs> I don't have to explain. <laughs> Told you you'd laugh, innit? <laughs> I have all these things, guys, but I'm single. I can't believe I'm single, it's a shock, bruv. It's a crisis. I shouldn't be single. I'm too fit. Do you know what I mean? But being single in your 20s is fine. It's like, oh, I'm single in my 20s. I'm sucking everyone's dick. Do you know what I mean? Just from 2009 onwards, my mouth was full. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> sucking dick, giving everything. Guys going down on me, sitting on faces every single day. Every single day. I was having sex with everyone. I fucked so many guys in my 20s. I was playing bareback roulette. You lot play bareback roulette? It's like, did he come inside me? Did he not? It's bareback roulette. And then you get your period, you do a little dance because you're not pregnant. Is that just me? Oh. It's like, I'm not pregnant. I was doing that in my 20s. I literally fucked everyone. I fucked the whole of Mock the Week Series 7. It would have been Series 8, but then they started adding women to the lineup really fucked up with my dick getting chances, do you know what I mean? Couldn't even fuck her, I'm looking. But yeah, I literally, I did it all. I did it all in my 20s, it's fine. But when you're 30s, you can't do that shit no more. It's like being single in your 30s, it's weird, it's like it has a smell. Do you know what I mean? People are like, oh, you're single and you're 30. Oh, oh, oh. Do you know what I mean? And even my mum, she started chatting shit, yeah? Because when in my 20s, I was fine. Now I'm 30, my mum's chatting shit, bruv. She's like, oh, why don't you settle down? Why don't you settle? I really want you to settle. Have some kids and settle. I might have some kids. Mum, I even had an abortion yet. <laughs> Let me have a couple of abortions first. A little practice runs before I commit to the kid. Do you know what I mean? I'm not fucking stupid. Settle, have kids. Not me, bruv. Not London Hughes, mate. I'll tell you that for free. No, I'm fu- I've been fucking. And now I'm too scared to have sex in my 30s because I feel like I've completed it. I completed it. No, I've completed it. I've, I've caught so much dick. My dating history is like a who's who of Uber drivers. Honestly. <laughs> I've done it. I've done it. And like, I, start, I started seeing this guy, right? And he really wants me to sleep with him. I'm not, I'm not sure yet. I'm not sure yet. But I genuinely was like, you know when you meet someone and you're like, oh, like I could fuck you. But then you want to be classy. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> want to save yourself. That's like me. Because I've been there. I've been sleeping with loads of guys. I, I slept with this one guy, right? Oh, my God. First of all, he was a white dude, yeah? I love my white guys, not going to lie. I do like my white guys. I like to catch them like Pokemon. Here you go. Gotcha. Gotcha, Ben. Gotcha, Adrian. I love him. I love my little, little nerdy. Now, I met this guy. He was a white guy. And the thing is, I knew he was white because he had a fetish over me, right? He called me a Nubian queen. Don't, no, no. White guys don't call black girls a Nubian queen. I don't call you lot a Caucasian prince. Your name's Steve. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm going to call you Steve. Steve's your name. Right? So he was called, uh, And he was really kinky. Right? He likes to do a little bit of role play. A little bit of form play. And I'm fine with that, right? I'm, I'm a bit of a hoe anyway. So um, he was like, I want to do a bit of role play. And he came home one night and he was like, oh, I want to act out Fifty Shades of Grey. I was like, right, okay. I mean, I ain't read the book because it's beneath me, but... <laughs> book's beneath me. Book's beneath me. I ain't read the book, but I was like, I'm ready. I'm down to do... Oh, yeah. Yeah, 50 Shades of Grey. Okay, cool. So he was like, yeah, I'm going to get into character. So he was being Dorian Gray, and he was like, broody, and like, I'm Dorian. I'm Dorian. And I was playing the basic white chick, so I was like... <laughs> <laughs> That's what she does in the film. She's so basic. So I was being her. I was like, I'm the basic white girl. <laughs> and then he was like, yeah, I'm Dorian. Uh, 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 I'm Dorian, Dorian. Then he started 
<laughs> tying me up. I shit you not, right? And he was tying me up in his sexy little, on his bed with these sexy little silk ties. And I was like, oh shit, tying me up. And then he was like, I'm going to get the whip. <laughs> now, whips for me, culturally, They don't end well. <laughs> I, I've never been whipped before, but I feel like I've worn it on my back my whole life. And when the white man went off to get the whip, <laughs> that's when I knew I fucked up. <laughs> he came back with this whip like, hua, 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 and I'm like, hoo, hey, ho, hey. Then I realized we weren't playing 50 Shades of Grey. We were playing 12 Years a Slave. <laughs> Listen, that's my time. I'm London Hughes. Thank you so much. London Hughes is dominating all over the world now. Check out her Netflix special. She's absolutely incredible. Now, I'm a feminist, but I get quite jealous of other women called Sarah. Imagine how intolerable my little ego finds it that there are so many exceptional comedians called Sarah. Sarah Kendall, Sarah Millican, Sarah Silverman, and up next, the magnificent Sarah Keyworth. Hello, hello, big, big year, big year for me this year. Gonna break up with my therapist, that's the plan. Because I've realised, I've been seeing her for about a year and a half now and I've realised that she knows everybody in my life so well and I've told her almost everything, that we're not doing therapy anymore, we're doing gossip. <laughs> and you have to, you have to end it with your therapist when she says the words, oh my God, she did not say that. <laughs> The other day I mentioned somebody that I'd never mentioned before and she wanted an Instagram to see what she looked like. <laughs> it's an absolute nightmare. I'm not very good at therapy, I'm just going to start my watch so I uh, know how much, because I could talk to you all night, but um, I, 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 therapy doesn't suit me in any way. I think I made a big discovery early on, I'm too northern to have it, <laughs> in that it's so expensive and that makes me so angry. <laughs> that it negates any of the therapeutic practice I might receive during the process. I'm not even northern, I'm from Nottingham, but I think that's north enough <laughs> to be too northern for therapy. It's so expensive. My therapist, her name's Hazel, she charges me £60 an hour, and the conversion rate is too easy on that, isn't it? A pound a minute, that? And I think about that with every passing second. <laughs> she likes to do five minutes of breathing at the top of each session. That is five pounds of breathing. <laughs> I can't afford that. I can breathe for free at home, Hazel. I need help. There was one day she sneezed. It cost me 25p. <laughs> one of the reasons I, I went to therapy was to talk about my friend Paul. Paul, funniest person I've ever met in my life. Paul, so funny. During the pandemic, I wasn't able to go and see him. Obviously, we were all in lockdown and stuff. So to cheer me up, what he did was he made me a game. And what he did was he sent me this uh, photograph of a really busy beach. And within the photograph, he'd photoshopped a, a dick pic. <laughs> right. The game was called Where's Willie? <laughs> and in a move that we both agreed was incredibly on brand, I never found it. <laughs> uh, genuinely, I couldn't find it. I rang him up, I was like, I'm completely dick blind, I can't do it, I'm too gay. I said, I found seven vaginas. He was like, didn't put any in there. I was like, I think you find you did. <laughs> and the reason I had to go talk to, the, to Hazel about Paul is because about this time last year, he, uh, he passed away. He died. He died in February last year. And it was a shock. It was a big shock. It shouldn't have been a shock because he told me. He did tell me a few months before he passed away. He said, I think I'm going to die. But he was so funny. I did think he was joking. I did, I thought he was kidding. I said, oh, that's a good one, Paul. And he said, well, I'm not kidding about it. And I was like, great stuff, going to put that in my show. And he was like, I'm not joking. And I was like, get, 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 get. And I thought it was really good stuff. It was very, very funny. But it was a shock. And it was hard. So I've been talking to Hazel about it, been trying to deal with it. And I was talking to her about how it was making me feel. And I was like, this is, um, this has been really tough. And I don't know how to go to work. I don't know how to do my job. Now that I'm grieving like this, it's the first time I've ever had a bereavement like this and I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to go to work. I used to write with Paul. I used to write comedy with Paul and I don't know how to do that. Now that that person 
that made my life so joyful, made my job so joyful, isn't here anymore. And she was just like, <laughs> yeah, that's tough. And it was really with a tone of like, you know, you should speak to somebody about this. <laughs> And then she was just silent for like a pound ten. <laughs> and it's not just her. I know, it's very hard. She doesn't know what to do. She, I think she's bad at her job, really. Um, but she doesn't know what to say. And it's hard. It is really hard. My girlfriend found it very hard because she wasn't grieving and she didn't know Paul in the same way. And that dynamic is very difficult. If you're grieving and you're around people that aren't grieving, that's really hard because you can't feel it. When you're in it, you can't feel it if you're not in it, which is a nice thing. Grieving when you're around people that aren't grieving is like being on a night out you're with all your friends, you've lost your phone, all your mates are on ecstasy and you're trying to explain to them that you've lost your phone. <laughs> and they're all just there like... <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> oh, well, that sucks! <laughs> oh, I love this song! You can't feel it, you can't feel it if you're not in it. It's very hard. And I've never, I've never known grief like it. Losing a friend, losing a friend at a young, like a young age is a, is a big shock. And I'd, I'd had, I thought I'd experienced grief. I've lost people before. I've like, you know, lost grandparents, things like that. <laughs> grandparents, I'm going to say something. You're not, you're not going to agree with it, but I'm going to say it. I think grandparents... <laughs> ..are a bad concept. I think they're a bad idea and I don't know why we do it, to be honest. And you're looking at me, like you don't, I don't, I don't, okay, I'll explain. My grandmother, I loved her so much, she was amazing. My grandmother, she was 81 when I was born. Why did they introduce us? What a ridiculous thing to do. When I'm a grandparent, I'm going to be fantastic. I'll go once, I'll go on the first day, I'll meet the baby once, I'll walk into the hospital and I'll go bend over, meet the baby once, and I'll say, don't waste your time loving me. <laughs> and then I'll walk into a fire. <laughs> Which admittedly might be harder for the baby to deal with in later life. I'm sure there are therapists that are slightly more adept at dealing with the my grandmother passed away peacefully of old age trauma than the my grandmother committed honour suicide on the day of my birth, but I've made my choice and I'm sticking with it. I was pretty lost, I think. I was lost doing my job was hard. It's very difficult to do my job because there was, uh, I, I wrote with Paul and it was very difficult to get up on stage and there was routines of mine that I found it very difficult I'd get really emotional sort of going through them because it'd be hard to do and the worst part about that was because he was so funny it was always my stupidest routines that I would get emotional during like shortly after he died I cried at a gig in Market Harbour because I was doing a routine about the fact that I don't wear white pants because I can't handle the truth Oh, all right, okay, there are two types of people in the world that wear white pants, okay? There are people with abnormal... Ab this is white underwear I'm talking about, white underwear right now. There's people with abnormally clean bums. <laughs> abnormally clean bums. Or it's people who are so brave they are willing to accept whatever the underwear has to show them at the end of the day. <laughs> Those type, and you're all looking at me like I'm completely disgusting and I'm not disgusting in any way so don't look at me like that I don't, I'm not saying that I don't get home at the end of each day and take off my pants and read them like tea leaves that's what I'm saying <laughs> I'm not there like oh man it looks like I'm coming into money <laughs> you know <laughs> so I said all of that crying <laughs> in Market Harbour and the problem with those jokes is that if you say them whilst crying it does look like you've shit yourself. <laughs> Thank you very much. Cheers. Zara Keyworth is gigging around the country. Her new show is critically acclaimed and you should go see it for yourself. Hopefully you've loved all the stand-up you've heard so far. When people think about feminism, they might imagine something uptight and miserable 
And The Guilty Feminist has always proved that it can be joyful, celebratory, exploratory, and filthy too. And also that a feminist can joke about anything. To prove which, here is Deborah Francis White to close the show on that most pertinent of topics, Build a Bear. So I want to talk a little bit, I don't have any children, but I have lots of godchildren and some cod children. These are children that have decided they're my godchildren, although their parents did not agree to that. (laughs) It's a name that we've come up with together because, you know, like cod sort of means like a fake, like a cod accent. So I'm a cod mother to a bunch of children, like a sort of concerning Pied Piper. (laughs) And... And two of my cod children, a boy and a girl, different families, four years old, I decided just before Christmas to take them to build a bear. Now, does anyone here know build a bear? Yeah, okay, great. So you understand. I took these children in to build a bear so they could build a bear, as is implied in the title. And as we walked in the door, a lady kind of came up in a sort of build a bear t-shirt and said, would you like to set a budget? And I said, no, no, they can have whatever they want. Yes. Now that response, that's the sound of parents. <laughs> Why is there no parent at the door going, set a budget, set a budget, whatever you do, set a budget. I'm not a parent. I don't know. I just want it to be fun, godmother. And just be like, sure, kids, you can have whatever you want. I thought, how expensive can it be? I mean, I've committed to two bears. Of course, they can have all the accessories. Just if you take nothing else away from the show tonight, or The Guilty Feminist as a podcast, set a budget (laughs) in Build a Bear. I did not know this. So we went, first of all, you have to pick your bear skin, which is a bit, I mean, it's all a bit extraordinary. And they said to Clemency, who was the little girl, they said, Clemency, what would you like? And she said, I'd like a cat, because they didn't realise, but Build a Bear is not always a bear. That is crucial information that you need. So she said, I would like a cat. And the lady went, and is the cat a boy cat or a girl cat? And I thought, all right. <laughs> like imposing gender on this. I thought, there, surely there should be a, a section for non-binary. <laughs> um, <laughs> there was not, there was not. And Clemency said, it's a girl cat. And they said, and what would you like your girl cat to say? Because there's a squeaker inside. But when you press it, it can say something. And she said, I would like it to say meow. And they said, good choice. (laughs) And then they said, terrifyingly, would you like a beating heart? (laughs) And they put this, like, genuinely, like a beating heart inside. I think when you press it, it goes boom. Ba-boom, 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 ba-boom. And so you can hear it, and it does it for a little while so the child can listen. Now, what puts me off that the most is one day the mechanics of that are going to fail. (laughs) And then the child is going to know, my bear is dead. (laughs) That is what is going to happen right there. But Clemency did want a beating heart inside. Of course, she wants her cat to be a real cat. And so then you take it to a lady who puts stuffing in it and sews it up in front of you, sort of like a reverse plastic surgery operation and then you go over to the accessories and clothing section and Clemency looked up at me and said what can I have and I said you can have whatever you want and she looked up at me and went do you mean whatever I want or do you mean three things (laughs) and I said I well you can have whatever you want she said I It's fine if it's three things, but tell me three things. I can choose three things. Clearly, she had been shopping with her mother in the past, and three things was enough. I said, no, you can have whatever you want, because I want to be fun godmother. And Clemency looked at me with some suspicion, and she said, do you mean... I said, yes, I mean it. And then she just went into sort of like a zen state. (laughs) Absolutely extraordinary. Sort of like a ninja. She closed her eyes. I'm not making this up. And spread her body out wide. And sort of just started to do this. Mm. And then she sort of pointed up and right and looked up. And there was a sparkly wand. And build bear had a sparkly wand. And then she pointed up here and said, mm. And then pointed at a sparkly tutu. And then mm, pointed at a super girl cape. Mm, mm, and started collecting all these accessories. And the lady who'd asked me if I wanted to set a budget, who presumably was on commission, came over and went, would build a bear like underwear? 
And I went, I mean, Clemency was all in the sparkly wings and things section. And I was just like, what? No. I, was, I was like, no, I'm not buying lingerie for a bear. No, no. <laughs> and then she went, would build a bear like a passport? <laughs> and I said, nothing about this child's experience is admin based. <laughs> she does not want paperwork. And she went, well, you'd be surprised, you see, because if build a bear gets a passport, there are some countries that will stamp build a bear's passport when you go there. You can queue and have build a bear's passport stamped. And I said, well, it's, she's not my child. And I do feel if I send her home with build a bear and a passport that her mother's going to be like, great. Every time we go on holidays, it's like, right, we're packing and where are you? Your passport, my passport. Now I've got to find build a bear <laughs> and build a bear's fucking passport. <laughs> And then queue up in the long queue when everyone else is just flipping through to Spain and holding their passports in the air. Well, we're going to have to stand in the every other passport queue. And we're all going to be build a bear soon, by the way, you British citizens. Uh, and, you know, I, I just thought, no, you know, I just I don't want the situation where we, the family, would love to go to Tel Aviv, but build a bear's been to Yemen, so... <laughs> I just said, no, no, it's fine. Build a bear does not want a passport. Meanwhile, Clemency, who has taken the anything you want literally, Build a bear is in a push chair <laughs> with roller skates on her feet. She has reading glasses and sunglasses. <laughs> she has amassed a pile. Honestly, I thought we've got to get out of here before Build a bear gets timeshare. I just. <laughs> Meantime, Frank, the little boy, He's standing there, and they say to Frank, what would you like? And he said, I'd like a dog. And they said, and is your dog a boy dog or a girl dog? And he said, it's a boy dog. And what would you like your boy dog to say when you squeeze it? Meow. <laughs> I was like, they have gone non-binary. They have, they have. I like this. I thought this child is good. This child is supposed to. They said he. They went. You sure, you wouldn't like to say woof woof. No, I'd like to say meow. You sure you wouldn't like to say woof woof? I think I should say woof woof. He wants it to say meow. <laughs> He's got a mind of his own. So they stuff build a bear. They put in the beating heart and everything, and they zip it up. And I say to Frank, "What clothes would your build a bear like?" And he looked up at me and went, "Well, none, because he's a dog." And I thought, well, he's only four, so I'll help him. And I said, would your build a bear like to be dressed as a fireman or Batman? And he went, well, neither, because he's a dog. <laughs> and he looked at me with sympathy in his eyes, like, who's going to tell this woman that dogs don't wear clothes? But it felt unfair because, you know, Clemency had a truckload of stuff. If a nuclear war came and her builder bear went down into a bunker, it would be fine for 20 years. I was just like, I can't really just go out with nothing. So eventually Frank agreed that builder bear should have four roller skates and a leash. <laughs> and I swear to you, that builder bear rolled out of that shop wearing Ray-Bans naked. <laughs> I thought this is something about, you know, whether it's nature, whether it's nurture, whether it's a bit of both, there is a gendered experience sometimes shopping with children and you're thinking, you know, no, they're all the same, they're all the same. And we don't know why it is, you know, it's probably a bit of both. But I thought, wow, you know, as feminist as you try and make your build a bear experience, ultimately sometimes gender will out. And I sort of made some kind of assumptions. And then I found my biological family. And so I had a four year old nephew. And I thought, I know. I know what to do, because I'm trying to make a good impression. I'm going to take him to Build-A-Bear. <laughs> so I took him to Build-A-Bear, and it was his birthday. And we walked in the door, a lady came over and said, would you like to set a budget? I said, yes. <laughs> yes, I would. So I said, yes, yes, I would love to set a budget. Thank you. I said he would like a Build-A-Bear, and Build-A-Bear could have two outfits. And they said, okay, what would you like? And he said, a bear. I was like, good, he's gone classic. I like this child. They went, is it a girl bear or a boy bear? And he said, it's a boy bear. And uh, they said, what would you like to say? He said, woof. They said, okay, great. I was like, three for three, we're all right here. Beating heart, zipped it up, take it over. I said, your builder bear can have two outfits because I had learned. He pointed 
had a pink ball gown and an emerald ball gown and a red wig and a blonde wig that would make RuPaul weep tears <laughs> of mascara. And I went, is that all you want? And he went, yep. And I went, now the thing is, I thought this was fabulous, obviously. But I've just joined this family. <laughs> and my nephew's father is a builder. And I thought, oh my God, I'm going to be seen as the showbiz interloper who comes in and immediately turns his son into a drag act. <laughs> I know what they're going to think. So I just thought, right, definitely have those because he's chosen them and I would never do anything to undermine that. But perhaps build a bear, I said, relenting on my budget, would also like a kilt. And he went, no, he wants these dresses. I said, perhaps he would also like to dress as a fireman. No, he wants these dresses. Would he like to be Superman? No, he wants these dresses, and that's all he wants. He was so adamant that Build-A-Bear have two ball gowns, two wigs, and when I really pushed him, a hairbrush and mirror set. <laughs> and I was like, everything I thought I'd learned about gender from coming to Build-A-Bear has just been turned on its head. And of course, because I'd taken two children to build a bear. I hadn't taken girls and boys to build a bear. This hadn't taught me anything about sons and daughters. It had only taught me about Clem and Frank. And now I was learning about a new little boy who was, in fact, I'm proud to say my flesh and blood, who was choosing drag. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's what he wants. That's what he wants. I'm going to take him back. And I went back and he ran up to his dad and said, look at my build a bear. And his dad, who's a builder, looked down and went, he's very well dressed, isn't he? <laughs> he looks wonderful. And I thought, I'm going to fit in fine in this family. <laughs> Thank you very much. Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.